Hey, thanks so much for joining us on our channel today. We want to encourage you to subscribe and like today's video. Also, today's word is brought to you by our truth partners. These are people who want to financially invest to help us get this message of truth to around the nation and around the world. You can become a truth partner today by simply going to creativechurch.com slash give. Again, thank you for partnering with us on this message of truth. And thank you for liking and subscribing to today's video. God bless you. I pray this sermon blesses your life. So Genesis 21. And we're going to read just seven verses and then you can sit down. Genesis 21, verse 1. And the Lord visited Sarah and he said... And the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age. At the set time on which God had spoken to him, and Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, Sarah bore to him Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son when he was eight days old. As God had commanded him. Now Abraham was 100 years old. How many of you know the older you get, having kids is for young people? (laughs) He was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born. And Sarah said, God has made me laugh, and all who hear will laugh with me. She She also said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? For I have borne him a son in my old age. Liliana's going to pray a blessing over Daddy. Go ahead, baby. Jesus, help my dad, help everybody in here feel better. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I love you. Great job. You can be seated. It's Mother's Day. And Mother's Day is not a biblical holiday. It is a historical holiday, but it ought to be a holiday that is celebrated every day in the life of a believer because the Bible says that we ought to honor our father and our mother that our days may be long upon the earth. How many of you want to live long? Come on. Honor mama might do more than that little smoothie shake you drinking that tastes bad and that little workout you doing. Honoring mama, honoring your parents is a commandment with a blessing that your days may be long upon the earth. And every time I say that, there's always somebody who says, well, you know, it's hard for me to honor my parent, typically because there's some uh, imperfection in their parent. Uh, But I think there's a lesson in the imperfection. Because until you learn how to honor somebody that's not perfect, you'll never learn how to honor yourself. You have to know how to honor somebody that's not perfect. A lot of people, the minute they find out there's something wrong with somebody, they stop honoring them. Well, you're never gonna honor anybody because there's something wrong with everybody. I know your mama told you that you was perfect, but she lied. (laughs) Jesus is the only one that's perfect, Amen. amen. And regardless of what they did right, what they did wrong, you're called to honor your parents. Hey, I just want to take a moment and let you know that today's sermon is brought to you by our Truth Partners. If you're interested in being a Truth Partner, simply go to creativechurch.com slash give and select Truth Partners today. Again, please subscribe and like today's video. It's blessing you. It's blessing your family. And hey, let's get back to the Word. And to be a mother is a very important thing. It is a very big thing. It's a very important job for which there is no retirement. There's no retirement. Um, Many times for which there is no acknowledgement. And so many wonderful things that my mother and grandmother placed on the inside of me Um, some things you don't even really realize how beautiful it is till you get older in life. And you don't appreciate how hard it was until you try to duplicate it. 
and you realize it's actually a hard thing to raise children to love Jesus and serve the Lord and put him first. And if you love the Lord, your mama did a good job. Come on, somebody. Your, your daddy did a good job. You go and try and duplicate it and see how hard it is. And you don't really have a respect for certain things till you get older. And um, you know, I, I didn't come up with this, uh, but it's been said that mothers are the, the glue, the stickiness that holds families together, that they are the secret keeper, that they are the uh, burden bearer, that they explain to the father their children. You know, sometimes mama has to explain the father to the children and explain the children to their father. Joanna will tell me, you know, you need to calm down. That they didn't mean it like that. And, and then she's got to go to them and say, you know your daddy loves you. And they're the glue that sticks it all together. And, you know, the reality is you never stop being a mother. I recently started working out a lot and um, trying to reclaim my health and I had posted a picture of me. I was drenched, sweating, just looked like I jumped in a swimming pool with my clothes on. I was so sweaty. And uh, several people had posted, you know, keep going, Pastor. You're going to do it. You know, you can accomplish it or don't give up. And my mom wrote, be careful. <laughs> <laughs> you're not as young as you used to be. You're going to pull something now. <laughs> you know, be careful. So she might be watching now. Give her a big God bless you. My mom, she did, she did a good job. And, you know, when we look at this story of Sarah and Abraham, it reminds me, I can't help but think of my wife as she went through the first trimester, second trimester, third trimester, and all eight of the children, all eight pregnancies, you know, they always say each pregnancy is different. And people asked Joanne and I, are y'all going to have any more? I said, my body can't take any more. I don't think we can have any more. But um, she, each pregnancy was different. And she, um, we noticed fairly early on, even within the first one, that um, and it seemed to get a little worse as she had more children, she said. But we noticed that she would forget, begin to forget little things that had happened. And, you know, there's a term for it called pregnancy brain. How I many of you ever heard of pregnancy brain? Some of you also got pregnancy brain, right? We still got pregnancy brain. And um, so we did some research and we found out pregnancy brain is actually a real thing. And it happens when all your cognitive juices flow towards producing what you're carrying. Uh, because when you start focusing on what you're carrying, you tend to forget what happened in your past. And it's the same thing we find with Sarah in Genesis 21. Uh, she forgot her condition because she began to step into her calling. How many of you would love to forget your condition and step into your calling? And it's funny how many times when people meet you, they kind of lock you into wherever you were when they met you. And when we're first introduced to Sarah, she is barren. The Bible says in her old age, calls her old, Abraham old. You, if the Bible calls you old. <laughs> you know, it's like a few times, you're probably, you know, you're getting up there. You know, when the Bible, the Bible says it. I mean, Abraham's 100 years old. And there's this statement in Genesis 18 that I love, and you guys can read it later on your own. You can jot it down, but 18, 10 through 15. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. And Sarah was listening in the tent, uh, which was behind him. She began to eavesdrop. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing years. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, after I have grown old, shall I have this pleasure? Verse 13, and the Lord said unto Abraham, why did Sarah laugh, saying, 
Surely I shall bear a child since I am old. Verse 14, is there anything too hard for the Lord? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? I don't know what your miracle is that you need today. Maybe you need healing in your body, deliverance in an area. One of your children may not be serving Jesus, problems in your marriage. I don't know what it is, but is there anything too hard for the Lord? That we serve a God that's able to heal, to deliver, to set free. So the question is, what transitioned her from not believing and her actually conceiving? What happened was she forgot what happened in her past because she began to focus on what she was carrying. What was in front of her? What was before her? came to ask you this morning, is it quite possible for you to forget what you went through because of what you're carrying now? Maybe it's time to make our windshield bigger than our rearview mirror. We start focusing on the dream and the destiny that God has for each and every one of our lives. And Sarah laughed about one thing in chapter 18. She laughed about something else in chapter 20 because she moved from her condition to her calling. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. That it's time to move forward and let people know us, not by what's holding us back, but by what we're running towards. It's time for us to focus on what God has called us to do rather than what we feel like we can't do because the reality is some things are just better to forget. Some things are just better to forget. Maybe it's better for us to forget how we used to be before Jesus. You know, there's a really interesting story about Austin Butler, and I've probably shared this before, who played Elvis in the, the recent movie. And they were making fun of him because the movie had been out for some time and he had shot it a year ago, and they're like, you're still talking like Elvis. And certain TV shows began to kind of pick at him. They're like, you still talk like Elvis, you're not Elvis. And he says, I'm not meaning to talk like Elvis, but you've got to understand, when I went into the film, I had to learn how to talk like him for a year. So I talked like him every day for a year. And then COVID hit. And they said, you can either stop or you can keep talking like him till we get through it. He said, I chose to keep talking like him. So now I'm two years in. Then I had a year of filming. So now I've been talking like Elvis for three years. He said, this is what he said. He goes, I forgot what I used to sound like. Maybe we need to talk like Jesus for a few years. So we no longer remember how we used to sound, rude and short and cussing at people. I've forgotten how to cut. I've forgotten how to do that. I've forgotten how I used to be because now I talk like Jesus. How many of you want to be like Jesus? To be like Jesus, right? And the Lord came back to Sarah in chapter 21. The Lord revisited her. I love that verse because God keeps his promises. Maybe God prophesied some things over your life when you were a teenager, you were a young adult. You maybe have forgotten some of those things, but God hasn't forgotten what he spoke over your life. God hasn't forgotten the prophecies that were spoken over you when you were a young man, when you were a young woman. God will revisit you again just like he did Sarah. And she went from laughing because of doubt to laughing because of expectation. Wouldn't it be great to move from doubt to expectation today 
And I remember Pastor Joanne when she was going through all these pregnancies. And I mean, you got to just realize we've been in diapers for 17 years. <laughs> 17 years. And uh, I, I'd watch her, you know, first trimester, second trimester. Around that third trimester, her walk began to change. And she got a little, you know, a little, little wobble wobble. <laughs> Especially when she was carrying the twins. And I noticed that the closer she got to her destiny, her walk began to change. The closer you get to your destiny with Jesus, your walk is going to change. And then I noticed that as she got closer to delivery, she began to crave things that she didn't used to crave. Just all of a sudden, she just have a craving for things that she, she, she used to never crave. I'm saying the closer you get to walking with Jesus, you begin to crave things you used to not crave. All of a sudden, you crave prayer. You just begin to crave prayer. You used to just, Lord, give me a good night's sleep. Lord, bless the food, you know, over the lips and through the gums. Bless it, Lord, because here it comes. You know, you, that was your prayer life, and that was it. But now you begin to think, I really, I'm really craving time with Jesus. I'm getting up early. I'm spending time with the Lord. You begin to crave worship. You just start to crave it. You begin to crave the house of God. I, I got to get to church. I want to be in God's house. I crave it. I want to be here. I'm sitting through two services. Which people are, there's some people in our church who sit through all three services. They just want to be in God's house. They just want to be in God's presence. As opposed to just come and leave and go sit and watch something, some other nonsense on TV. They just go, I want to be in God's house. I want to be in worship three times. You just begin to crave it. She just, she just developed cravings. And I was like, since when do you like this? Since when do you like that? She's like, I don't know, I'm just craving it. And there's gonna be people in your life as you begin to crave Jesus are gonna go, who are you? When did you start, when did you start getting up early to start praying? Since when do you wanna go to church all day? Since when do you wanna start reading your Bible? And they're gonna start, they, maybe they mock you, but mock me all you want to. I've got a craving because I'm close to birthing my destiny. And then I, and then I also noticed that that there were some things that before she was pregnant, she was totally fine with. Totally fine. I could bring something in the house and I could open it and I could cook it. She'd be fine. But then I noticed the closer she got to her destiny, the, the closer she got to her breakthrough, the closer she got to holding her dream, there were things that made her sick. That didn't used to make her sick. There were things that if I brought it in the house, what is that? Get that out of here. I can't, I cannot, I cannot have it in the house. We've been eating this for years. I know we've been eating it for years, but I cannot, I cannot see it. I cannot smell it. I cannot look at it. I don't even want to know it's in here because it's making me sick. There are some things that you used to be fine with that the closer, oh God, I don't know who I'm talking to, but the closer you get to Jesus, Gossip starts making you sick. People who want to cause discord and disunity just start to make you sick. People who can't control their temper just start to make you sick. People, people who just want to run after, there's certain movies I used to watch that I can't watch, certain language that didn't bother me and now it bothers me. There's just certain things in your life that you used to be okay with that you're not okay with anymore because you are close to your destiny. And there's some people in this room who know exactly what I'm talking to you because you are pregnant with destiny. You are in the season of birthing what God wants to bring in your life. And there's other people in here, I'm boring them to tears. I just wish this big guy would shut up so they could get on with their day. And it's because they're not pregnant with anything. 
They're not hungry for anything. They don't have anything in front of them that's bigger than their past. And the closer you get to Jesus, the more your heart begins to be moldable and pliable and bendable in his presence. And God changed it. With one word from Jesus, their life changed. God did not change their age to change their circumstance. God did not change their place to change their circumstance. They just began to worship. And the more you begin to worship and just get in the presence of Jesus, you begin to realize worship is a weapon against the enemy, that worship is a prophecy, that what I believe is gonna happen will happen, that my worship is a prophecy to my circumstances, that if God spoke it, it will happen in my life. Do you know why God can't lie? The reason God can't lie is it's like if I, if I said this jacket's blue, it's not. I'm lying because it's like, I don't know, sand or tan or whatever it is. But if, if God calls it blue, it becomes blue. That's why God can't lie. If God says you're blessed, If God says you're healed, they didn't get it over here. Let me try this section over here. If God says anxiety is gone, it's gone. Let me try this section. If God says depression has to pack up its bags today and leave your life and never come back again. If God says your entire family is gonna walk in in an anointing and a blessing and a favor, it, then it doesn't matter it doesn't matter if the circumstances in my life haven't changed. See, when Sarah was pregnant, nothing on the outside changed. Something on the inside changed. See, if God is, when God begins to do things in your life, he doesn't change your outside circumstances as much as he's changing your inside. When I go and they put me on the treadmill or the bike, all these other demonic <laughs> devices that people have built who don't know Jesus, especially the stair machine, is demonic. That's what, if you go to hell, that's, all, that's what's in hell, is stairs. Welcome to hell, get on the stairs. That's all that's in hell, stair machines. And when I get on that treadmill and they turn the thing on and I'm running and I'm sweating and everything is moving and shaking and jiggling and bouncing and everything is going everywhere. And, and I get off the treadmill and the treadmill looks exactly the way it did when I got off. <laughs> it's because I am not trying to change the treadmill. The treadmill is trying to change me. So when God has you on something and it looks like it's not changing. When God has you in a season of life or a problem in life or a difficulty in life or something you're walking through and, and it's like it's not changing, it's because God is not trying to get you to change it. God is using it to change you. That's what got me so stirred and refocused in so many different areas of my life in the first place because I felt like I was on this treadmill and, the tre and nothing was changing. And the Lord began to speak to me, I'm not trying to get you to change it. I am using this treadmill and you're, it's like it's not changing, it's not changing and you're doing everything you can get it to change and it's not changing. I am using it to change you. And when you let God begin to change you and you begin to let his presence get in your heart and in your life. See, you just have to reason in your heart how, much, how many hours do you need to spend with Jesus to be like Jesus? Some of you are, are very, you're, you're just a lot more tender hearted. Like my daughter, Victoria, I think she could spend two minutes with Jesus and she'd be like Jesus. 
Alexander and Nicholas, I have to spend a few hours with Jesus. <laughs> be like Jesus. They're more like their father. And if I don't spend time with Jesus, like serious time with Jesus, then I'm not like Jesus. I'm like me. And I make decisions like me. And I'm rude like me and selfish like me and short with people like me and angry quickly like me and can't control my temper like me. I know you think you're a good person, but you're not. I know you think you're a super kind, generous, loving person. You're not. You're not. You need to be like Jesus. It's Jesus that makes you like that. And so you just have to assess yourself. I'm not. If people don't tell you you're like Jesus, it's because you're probably not like Jesus. When they begin to say things like, you know, so and so is like, if the answer is not Jesus, it's because you're not spending time with Jesus. And you can come to church and know all the songs and sing all the stuff and not be like him at all. And your life doesn't become a lightning rod for the presence of God and people to want to, people should want to be like you because people want to be like Jesus. The Apostle Paul told Timothy, imitate me as I imitate Christ that if you were to follow me, it would be as if you were following Jesus. If I followed your life all week, would it be like I followed Jesus? If I talked like you all week, would it be like I talked like Jesus? If I went where you went, would it be places Jesus would go? If I watched what you watched, would it be what Jesus watched? If I responded the way you responded, would it be the way Jesus responded? If I cared for people the way you cared for them, would it be the way Jesus cared for them? And the only way you'll ever be like that is if you spend time with Jesus. And everything in your life is trying to pull you away from spending time with the Lord. Valuing the presence of God requires more stewardship than stewarding his power or his gifts. Stewarding the presence of God requires a more meticulous life and a different set of values. Because when God really begins to deal with your heart, he deals with your motives. Because the one thing you can't hide from God is your motive. What do you want and why do you want it? It is it about God or are you trying to prove something to somebody who doesn't believe in you? And we've got a whole generation of people. A lot of us have kids in this demographic who know how to build and there's people who are famous and they know how to build social media and they know how to build platforms because they know how to build social media but they don't know how to build history with God. They don't have history with Jesus. They don't have a history in Gen Z is really, in so many ways, a generation that has been programmed to believe that more followers means more anointing. More YouTube followers means God's blessing it. More, more followers on social media means I'm, I'm more anointed. When you've got people like this person who's, you know, I don't know, maybe they're a fashion whatever person, two million followers. You got Tommy Barnett, who's a general in the faith, who's like 85, there's like 2,000 followers. So many generations doesn't even know who he is. And they would think this person's more anointed because they have more followers. No, it's not. That's not how the anointing works. There's a generation who believes that what it means to be anointed is fame. Fame does not equate to anointing. And gifting does not equate to authority. You can be just gifted and talented. doesn't mean you're anointed. What's amazing is when you're anointed and gifted, when you're gifted and talented and anointed, 
but anointing God can use on somebody who has no gifts and no talents. See, gifts and talents make you look good, but anointing makes God look good. That's why we do talent shows and not anointing shows. Because let's see your talent and let's admire your talent. Wow, look how talented you are. Look how gifted you are, but where's the anointing? The anointing costs what it costs and it doesn't go on sale. And moms, hear me, if you wanna teach your children to be anointed, if you wanna be anointed to be the mother God's called you to be, if you wanna be anointed to be the father God's called you to be, teenagers, young adults, listen to me. If you want an anointing from God, this is how you get it. You build a history with the Lord of being in his presence. You pass tests of your character when no one is watching. You have to pass those tests of what's on your phone, what's on your internet history, what's on your social media history. What do you do when no one's watching? You have to pass that test. And then the last thing you do to be anointed, you develop a history with God, you pass tests of character when no one's watching, and then you go through things that try to kill you. And when they don't kill you, you gain authority in those areas, and God anoints you to minister in those areas of your life. And that's how you develop an anointing with God, and it costs what it costs. You don't get it because somebody lays hands on you. You don't get an anointing to lead worship like John because John laid his hands on you. You don't get an anointing to be a mother because a mom lays hands on you. You go through the pain and the difficulty, and the storm, and the trial, and the adversity, and the heartache, and the pain, and so many things in life that try to kill you, and destroy you, and make you give up, and you refuse to quit, and you refuse to faint, and surrender, and negotiate at the table of your adversaries, and you say, no, I will stand for God, with, even if nobody recognizes me, if nobody thinks I'm wonderful, if nobody ever acknowledges me, if nobody ever follows me, I will build my character and I will pass the test when no one is watching and God anoints your life. He anoints your life. And then he uses the gifts and the talents that he's given you to make him famous and him lifted up, and that he may receive all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. And this is what it takes to live a life without compromise. The Lord told me this week in prayer, he said, son, the wages of sin is death. He said, tell my people, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. How many of you ever heard that verse? I said, Lord, I've heard that verse. He said, listen to me. He said, the wages of sin. How many of you have a job? Raise your hand if you have a job. If you have a job, you're earning a wage. You're earning it. He said the wages of sin are earned. You're working at it. You work at sin. Sin is a master. Sin is a slave master. You, you are earning a wage of sin. But the gift of God, see you don't earn a gift. You, you earn a wage, but the gift of God is received. The gift of God is eternal life. And the problem is the church has inverted it. 
and we think sin is free and easy and simple, and we have to work at Jesus. We have to work at salvation. We have to work and labor and toil at our walk with God, and it's not. You're, you're, you're working at sin, and what we need to do is just receive the gift of Jesus. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That is the heart. And so the uniform, you can play something for me, Jonas. The uniform of a Christian is a cross on your back. That I'm a dead man or woman walking. And it means that my agenda has died. And see the anointing, the fire. The anointing of God is not attracted to your gifts. Hear me. The anointing is not attracted to your gift. The anointing of God is not attracted to your talents. It's attracted to that bloody cross on your back. The cross of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is what attracts the anointing and the power of God to your life. It's what attracts the presence of God into your home that would allow the presence of God to minister to your children. That we don't need to tear down the world to protect our kids. What we need to do is just lift up the beauty of Jesus. Just lift up Jesus. We have nothing. And if you're visiting today as a church, we have nothing shinier to offer you than Jesus. We have nothing more beautiful than him. He is the darling of heaven. Paul says, I claim to know nothing except Jesus and him crucified. That as wonderful as these musicians may be, some of them very young, it's not Jonas's gift that God's attracted to. It's the anointing of Jonas getting in the presence of Jesus and him wearing a cross on his back. And Jonas, you winning the test in private And walking through things that would try to kill you and survive them that allows God to anoint you to be used for his glory. And he will take that and build his church. And any demon of any generation that tries to stop it will not prevail against the church. This is the beauty of having a destiny in front of you that's bigger than your past. To birth a dream and a destiny that would change hearts and change lives for generations to come. Don't quit, don't give up, don't surrender. Get in his presence and believe God to keep his promise and to birth destiny in your life. Come on, you get something out of this today. Hey, if this sermon blessed you and your family, I wanna encourage you to be a truth partner. You can do that by simply going to creativechurch.com slash give and partnering with us to help get this message of truth out to more people in our nation and around the world. It is our truth partners that make this a reality. Again, thank you for subscribing to our channel. Thank you for liking today's video. We'll see you back here on the channel real soon.